Select function takes a predicate of value and the default, and if predicate holds of the value, it turns the value, otherwise it turns the default. In ML, it has this type scheme. It, the predicate is alpha to bool, the value and default are both alpha, and the result is alpha. This is familiar, but it's actually quite a strange type to give that function. It's demanding that the default, D, be of such a type that you could pass it to the predicate, when at no point does that actually happen in the program. The data flow of the function maps both v and the default to the result, and maps v to the argument p, but only by completely ignoring the direction of those arrows could we conclude those things were all alpha. And that's exactly what ML does by unifying types, by using this symmetric equality relation to fit a function's argument into its, sorry, to fit a value into a function's argument. It ignores the direction of data flow and unifies all of these to be a single variable. In ML sub, as I'll be describing today, we take care of the direction of data flow and we give it a more general type signature. We say select takes a predicate on alpha, an alpha, which is a thing you can pass to the predicate, and the default is a beta, which may be a different type, and it returns the upper bound of alpha and beta. So this means that I can pass as the default value D a record which has fields A, B, and C, a predicate which infects field A, and the default value which doesn't have a field A at all. And I'll know that the result has whatever fields are in common between the value and the default. So, usually when someone stands a puppel and starts describing a type system, uh, they'll begin by telling you of all of the fancy things they've added to the programming language, that the syntax of expression has some wonderful new features in it. But this doesn't. The syntax of expression is ML. Uh, there's functions. We've added records, because records have more interesting subpopulations than just functions, and booleans in order to have a base type, uh, and let, the standard thing in ML. I am going to be careful to try and distinguish the variables bound by let from the variable bound by lambda, because those work slightly differently in ML systems. But the expressions are just plain ML, simple types plus lush polymorphism. I, giving up on that, the next thing I would try to get you interested in would be the type system. I would show off some fancy new typing rules. But there's also nothing interesting going on there either, uh, because the typing rules of ML sub are the typing rules of ML, to which we have added the typing rule for subtype, the standard subsumption rule. The interesting thing in this system that, that I really want to talk about is T, the exact construction of the lattice of types in ML sub. So much previous work on subtyping starts off by defining types something along these lines. We start off with the ground types. Uh, so here I've just added top bottom types and function types, ignoring records and booleans. But we start off with ground types with no type variables in them. And then we define their subtyping order. We say that bottom's the smallest and top is the biggest. And this slightly complicated looking rule, it's just the normal cone contravariance for functions. That is, we are saying a strong, we're making a stronger statement about a function if we make a stronger statement about its result and a weaker statement about its domain. Then, having defined the ground types, the usual approach is to note that these form a lattice, that that subtyping order happens to have least upper bounds and greatest lower bounds for any pair of types. Uh, and that forming a lattice is incredibly useful if we're trying to do type inference, because uh, the least upper bound describes the output of a conditional expression. If it may produce A or it may produce a B, then we can say it produces the upper, their upper bound. And the greatest lower bound describes inputs that are used in multiple ways. If it's used as an A and as a B, then it must be provided as a lower bound of A and B. However, this soon ran into trouble. So we next add variables by quantifying for the ground types, and then we say, we ask simple subtyping questions of the sort that a compiler will be expected to answer. Is something like this true for all type alpha? So this one is true for all alpha. 
we can decompose that with this typing rule for functions, and we see that alpha is always less than top, and bottom is always less than alpha. But when we move to using the lattice operators, we get questions that are not significantly longer, but astoundingly difficult. Uh, so I took this example from François Paty's PhD thesis, but there are various others in papers over the years. Um, this is very non-obviously true. Uh, to show that it's true, uh, you can do case analysis on alpha. Uh, if alpha is top, then the left-hand side becomes top, and otherwise alpha is smaller than biggest function type, and you can spend a few lines working this out and it comes out as true. And the odd thing here, the thing that makes me really doubt this is the right way to be building type system, is that this is true by case analysis, and this is only true by case analysis. If we extend the type system, we don't change any of the types that are there, we don't change the subtyping relationships between the function types top and bottom, but we simply add a new type of function. So these, these T1 to T2 with funny sort of arrow, I'm going to insert them above standard functions. We can think of this as a function which may have side effects, if we think of the original arrow as being pure, or something similar. So we add these into the lattice, and we don't affect any of, any of the existing subtype relations. And now, we have a counterexample using this new type to that previous case. So th th this worries me. Uh, I don't think my compiler should ever be accepting a program on the basis of the non-existence of some types. So I want to design a type system in a way which is extensible, so that adding new type doesn't invalidate anything that we previously knew. The next way in which extensibility breaks in this style of definition is that it permits vacuous reasoning by defining various uh, lower bounds to be bottom. So in many systems of non-structural subtyping, the lower bound of two types of different sorts, of a function type and a record type, then they have no subtypes in common, so they're lower bound bottom, which intuitively seems to make sense. Then you get this odd relation, that the lower bound of records and functions, those are all Booleans. So what this is saying is that there can be nothing which is both a record and function, which is not also a Boolean. So it's saying that the language designer is then unable to add things which are both records and functions. You can never extend language with something which can be both applied and projected from, even though several languages like C++ and Python didn't originally have such objects, but they were later added. So there's two principles I want you to build an extensible type system. The first one is we treat type variables indeterminate. We don't find the ground types first and quantify over them. We genuinely add type variables to the subtyping order as opaque things live on their own. And the second thing is that we build a distributive lattice rather than just plain lattice, uh, which prevents cases of that sort of vacuous reason that we saw on the previous slide. So what do we end up with? We, the standard types that we had before, records, booleans, and functions, and they have the same subtyping order within themselves, that the subtyping rule for records is the standard subtyping rule for records, and subtyping rule for functions is the standard subtyping rule for functions. But we identify fewer of the strange types. The type of things which are both records and functions top to top is added freely as an object in its own right and not considered the same as the bottom type. Okay, so that describes how the type system is defined. Uh, and then this turns out to be enough to begin doing type inference. So these lattice operators, the upper bound, lower bounds, can be used to describe uh, sort of values that a function produces or requires. If we have a function that produces either A or B, then we type it as producing the upper bound. And if we have a function that requires both A and B, we type it as, as taking their lower bound. Interesting thing is that upper bounds never occur when we're describing inputs, and lower bounds never occur when we're describing outputs. So we can divide types into two different classes. <coughs> the output types and the input types. And the output types have upper bounds in them, 
the input types have lower bounds in them. And the upper types also have bottom in them because I can produce something which is a non-terminating computation, but can't demand that my input be a non-terminating computation. The lower bounds have the upper have the a top type in them because I can accept something not care what it is, whereas I can't uh, produce something without knowing what I've made. So Hindley-Milner type inference is based on unification. <coughs> there are three different places where unification occurs. Uh, when we unify the, an input, the types of inputs used in two different places. So this is, we've got a lambda bound variable which is used in some sub-expression and used in another sub-expression. We unify the types of which it is used. And similarly, an output, when we're, we've got a conditional expression which produces two different sorts of values, we unify those types as well. And finally, when we're taking the output of one expression, feeding it to the input of another expression, we have to unify those types as well. So in ML sub, unifying two input types, we never need to touch the types. That's just introducing a meet. It would be both of these things. Unifying two output types, we just introduce a, a join and we're bound. The only constraints that we must solve are when we're trying to feed the output of one expression into the input of another. So the only difficult case in unification, <coughs> or in our equivalent of unification, will be when we're trying to feed a positive type and we're trying to show that it's a subtype of a negative type that's required some other part of the program. So, right, so next thing is how do we, so unification uh, based on um, substitutions. So if we have an, if we have the identity function, alpha to alpha, so it takes its input and returns something of the same type, <coughs> and we learn a constraint from some part of the system, so the unification tells us that alpha must be equal to t. Uh, so we've got this function which, as well as returning it, it also uses its argument in some context that requires a t. Then that substitution means we, sorry, solve that constraint with a substitution by replacing all occurrences of alpha with t, and we get the result t r o t. So the substitution of replacing all occurrences of alpha with t solves the constraint that alpha equals t. <coughs> in a subtyping system, if a function uses its argument as type t, that doesn't give rise to an equality constraint. That just says that all values which are alpha must also be t. Uh, it's using it as, an in, as a t minus, so it's using it as the input to something else. So this constraint uh, is not solved. We, we can't solve this by simply replacing all occurrences of alpha with t minus because we don't know those are the same. However, we do know that the meet of alpha and t minus is t minus. So <coughs> this type uh, is the type of functions which take an input, use it as a t minus, and then return the input unchanged. It's equivalent to this type, uh, which takes things which are both an alpha and a minus and returns that they're just an alpha. So in ML sub, we have to we use something very, very similar to unification that I'm calling by unification, where the major difference is instead of producing a single substitution that maps variables to types, it produces a substitution that maps variables to types differently according to polarity. So in this case, the solution of alpha less than t minus is the bisubstitution which maps all negative occurrences of alpha to the lower bound of alpha and t minus. So once we've got a way of, um, sorry, once you've got a way of solving variable constraints, so when we've got a variable combined with a type, then we can decompose larger constraints into smaller constraints, much in the manner of standard unification algorithm. So conveniently, the only case where we need to do this is when we're feeding the output of some sub-expression to the input of another sub-expression. So when we're saying that a positive type, T plus, is a subtype of a negative type, T minus. These are the only constraints that we need to decompose. Because we've ensured that upper bounds only ever occur in T plus, so they will only ever occur on the left of the subtyping constraint, and because 
And this lower bounds only ever occur in T minus, those only ever occur under what? Both of these cases are very easy to decompose because we have these equations that an upper bound on the left can just be split into two different constraints. The difficult cases of having a lower bound on the left or an upper bound on the right never come up because of the syntactic restrictions. <coughs> so this means that we can do unification much as standard unification is done in the guts of an ML type checker. We're just decomposing a large complex constraint into a collection of smaller constraints, breaking them all down further and further until we get to atomic constraints and then eliminating those with replacements. The only difference is that the result is a bisubstitution, giving different answers for the positive and negative occurrences of a variable. When we want to combine the results of multiple solution of, of solving multiple constraints, we first, if we have a system of constraints, this thing of C1 and C2, we first solve C1, that gives us one by substitution, we apply that to C2, and then we solve the result. And by composing the results of solving both these, we get a solution to the whole system. So this is very familiar if you've implemented the unification algorithm. In particular, if you write down the, this algorithm for unification, and you delete three, three or four lines or something to do with subtyping, the ones that mention meet and joins, what you get is exactly Martinelli and Montanari's unification algorithm. So the in type inference algorithm for ML sub works more or less the same as ML. It walks the syntax tree of the program, building a principal type at each node. Um, but because of the more well-behaved lattice of types that we've constructed, and because the polar types restrict where the difficult constructors of upper bound and lower bound can occur, uh, then the binification algorithm can always handle these constraints and produces a principal type. Uh, so in future work, uh, so to this point is I've been talking about integrating subtyping with essentially late 1970s, early 1980s technology. Uh, technology has moved on since then, and as Stephanie Varick was just telling us, there are lots of fun things that have been integrated with Hindley Milner type inference, especially in school land. Uh, so the biggest bit of future work is to see how many of these fit into a uh, subtyping world. Uh, how many of them are, were, were any of these relying on some property of equality that doesn't hold here? Will it work easily? So I hope to find that out soon. Thanks. We have some time for questions, and uh, if you want to ask a question, please uh, find uh, somebody with a mic. So your types are restricting where you can have unions and intersections. So, which means it seems that users are not going to be able to write unions and intersections in their in general positions in their types. Is that right? And if so, have you thought about if you allow users to freely use unions and intersections, how that would impact the nice results that you're able to get? Well, so yes, it's correct that at the moment the type annotations can only contain unions, unions and intersections according to this model. Uh, I think it would be possible to allow them general position, but I don't think it would be particularly useful. Uh, this language has no notion of type case, unlike other systems that use union and intersection like operators. So if I write that some value is the upper bound of an int and a string, there's not a huge amount that I can do with it. Uh, so it might be possible to do that, but I I'm not sure there would be interesting programs that you could only write by doing that. Um, I loved reading your print, and one of the many great things about it is that there is a link to a document that has much more content uh, about the same ideas. So, uh, I think it's running. Uh, your thesis manuscript is available online. Uh, yes, my thesis manuscript is available on the website and has been there for multiple minutes. <laughs> uh, can we 
have the next to come and uh, try to connect. Um, last question? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, uh, can you go back to slide uh, 24? <laughs> Please. Um, could you explain why you, you say this is a hard case of a tau 1 uh, intersection tau 2 should be a subtype of tau, tau 3? Can't you just require that one of them is a subtype of tau 3? Right, so that is uh, sound but incomplete. So <laughs> if tau 1 is a subtype, t if tau 1 is a subtype of tau 3, then it is the case that this holds, and if tau two is a type of T three, then it is the case that this holds. But it need not be. Neither of those need to hold for that result to hold. If you think of it as sets in intersection, then like the intersection of the even numbers and odd numbers is indeed a subset of a set containing five. But neither of those two statements holds. Well. Neither the even numbers nor the odd numbers is a subset of that in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, second question. Um, in your paper, you support uh, recursive types and you use uh, finite state automaton to, to encode them. Um, I, I think I've seen that um, the uh, regular language inclusion problem is P space complete. Does that mean that your type stem has a subtype check that is P space complete? Uh, yes. Uh, but you have to write. Uh, it's P space complete in the minimum size of the automaton. Uh, so if you so if you have a type with many shared subnodes, mm -hmm. uh, then you can write that as a very compact automaton. Uh, you can't write that terribly compactly as a typing term. So I'm not sure if it's P space complete in the size of the term that you actually have to write. Um, but certainly, if you write a very complicated nest of recursive types in a way that's not reducible, then you will hit pathological cases. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, let's thank the speaker.